Forget the vodka, the bears, and the ballet. We are going to chat about the most fascinating of all things Russian, the language. And since you're here, I'm guessing you either have a very good reason to study Russian, or you're one of those people who just swoons every time a Russian person opens their mouth to speak. Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Андрей. Я русский. Живу в Сибири. И нахожусь сейчас у себя дома в городе Омске. Сейчас январь 2020 года, утро выходного дня, за окном отличная погода, как вы можете видеть, все покрыто снегом, как и должно быть зимой. Don't worry, we feel the same way around here. Russian is a sexy language, but learning Russian is also an excellent ambition. So, shall we find out why? Let's do that and stay to the end, because I have some tips you will want to hear after hearing this story. My name is Ollie Richards, by the way, and if you're new here, well, this channel is all about helping you learn a new language quickly using the power of story so you can become fluent faster and live your best life. Now, before Russian, there was Old East Slavic, and its original speakers were Slavic tribes in the early Middle Ages. Rooted deep in the oldest beginnings of Europe, these guys were closely linked to Viking tribes. They traded with one another, they fought each other. There was a lot of intermixing going on as well. Now, their language was the prototype of modern-day Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian. Russian today is spoken by 260 million people, and it's an official language in five countries, Russia, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan. It is also an unofficial lingua franca in Ukraine and many former Soviet countries, like these ones. But that's not all. There are Russian speakers pretty much all over Eastern and Western Europe. Even Israel has at least one million ethnic Jewish Russian immigrants. Now, let's not forget the US either here, because there is a huge Russian population there, over three million people, in fact. And this brings me to a question that some of you have asked me, which is, does Russian have dialects? Well, I can just hear my Russian friends yelling a resounding nyet, and for the most part, that's true. While there were once many regional dialects, the, the Soviets neutralized these as much as possible. Teachers and broadcasters had to be educated in the standard Moscow dialect, so that's what people heard when they switched on the TV or the radio. And by the 19th century, the, the dialects really had started to disappear. Now, these days, linguists divide modern Russia into three main dialects. You've got northern, southern, and central. The central dialect is the one you'll hear in the big cities. It's also the literary language. And even though Russia is so vast as a country, the other two dialects actually aren't all that different. Apart from the odd word, all Russians will pretty much understand each other all the time. So why are there disagreements over Russian dialects? Okay, let's say you set off on a journey. You start in the north and you travel all the way down to the south, chatting to everyone along the way. Well, if you do this, you are going to hear people speaking a little differently. For example, the further south you go, the more guttural the g becomes. And in Moscow or St. Petersburg, people speak very slowly and pronounce words very clearly. In fact, the eastern side has a much faster way of speaking that can be really hard to catch when you're just learning Russian. But are these dialects or just different accents? It's an open question. Let me know what you think in the comments, especially if you are Russian. I want to hear from you. Or we could just listen to some funny Russian peasants talking. That is one hilarious movie, and you can read my review of this. And if you're enjoying this video, please hit like and subscribe and turn on notifications too, so you don't miss the next feature language video. So let's say that there are no significant dialects on Russian turf. But what about all those migrations that happened? Well, here is a cool story from Alaska, of all places. It's about a dialect of Russian that's been isolated from other varieties for over a century. So way back in the 1700s, some Russian explorers arrived in Alaska and claimed it for Russia. Sounds like quite a long journey, doesn't it? Although it looks quite easy on this map. Most of them left after the US bought the land in 1867, 
but a handful of families like this stayed. And some of the old timers in that region, like 20 people, still speak the old Ninilchik Russian. I found you a tiny sample here of what this sounds like. Now, as for the rest of America, there were four huge immigration waves from the late 19th century onwards. Over three million Russian immigrants in the US. And in the 60s, Russian was extremely popular in Cuba. Uh, Cuba was allied with the Soviet Union at that time. So don't be surprised if you meet a few Cubans called Yuri. You will even hear uh, Russian spoken in small pockets over South America as well. I guess there really are Russians everywhere, but is the language important? Is it worth learning? Well, think about this. Russian is the eighth most spoken language in the world. It's huge on the internet, and Russian is extremely useful in international business too. But you could also just learn Russian for the thrill of it, because Russian isn't as remote as it seemed in the imagination. If you love adventure or if you're a digital nomad, you can fly to Russia in just a few hours. And suddenly you're in an exotic land that is so big it crosses 11 time zones. Can you imagine the places that you could explore there? It's pretty wild. So this brings me to the next big question I hear. Do I have to study Cyrillic, the Cyrillic script, if I learn Russian? Well, this all depends on your goals. Do you just want to enjoy Russian movies from your sofa? Or do you really want to understand all things Russian? Now, I'll be honest, if you dream of exploring Russia in a meaningful way, it will not be a walk in the park if you can't even read the road signs. But it's so much more than a practical move to learn Cyrillic. I mean, once you've nailed it, once you can read it, then you can actually read some of the most profound literature on the planet. So if you're not easily intimidated, I challenge you to give it a go. The Cyrillic alphabet really is not it really isn't the hardest part of Russian. It will only take you a few days to learn. I mean, you could come back here literally next week and brag that you've learned Cyrillic. The best part is that you'll be learning the alphabet of over 50 different languages, which is a pretty big win, right? Mind you, Kazakhstan is busy switching to the Latin alphabet, which is interesting. But where did Cyrillic begin? So ancient Russia used the old Slavic writing system, and no one knows for sure what kind of writing it was. An alphabet or just calendar symbols and, and, and pictograms. But anyway, it was lost and then replaced by the first Slavic alphabet in the year 863 called the Glagolitic alphabet. Doesn't it look cool? This is obsolete now, but the Cyrillic alphabet used today is just as ancient. It was made in, this, in the 10th century. Now, it was named after a monk, Saint Cyril. He's the guy who created the uh, Glagolitic alphabet. And the original included the 24 letters of the Greek alphabet, and then 19 letters for sounds specific to the Slavic language. But thankfully, all this is a little bit easier these days. Peter the Great introduced lowercase letters. He was quite the man back in the 1600s, really, when he was, when he was a czar. He came up with some interesting reforms, like banning beards. I mean, to be fair, you could just pay the beard tax. All a bit weird. But Peter the Great also simplified Cyrillic. He personally redesigned 32 letters to look more like Latin ones. Now, there have been a few minor reforms since then, and this is modern Cyrillic. But like I said, it really is not the alphabet that is the hard part. Now, this video is not a grammar lesson, but I do just want you to realize how rich the Russian language is. So let's talk about it. First, Verbs of motion. This, this is something that can make your head spin a little bit. So there are many changes you can make to one word in Russian, allowing you to express yourself in a very precise way. And I'll try to give you one really simple example. Iti hadit. Look at these two Russian words. They both mean to walk or to go somewhere by foot. So why use two different words? Well, it's because when Russians say they are going, they also indicate whether they are going in one direction or making a return trip. Now, this verb suggests that your movement has only one direction, but this one implies that you're coming back or going in more than one direction. This is called a verb pair in Russian, and there are 14 pairs altogether, all for various types of movement. 
which is pretty cool, don't you think? Now in the description below, I'll, I'll put a link to my website where you can read more about Russian verbs if you are so inclined. It's very interesting. But then there are both hard and soft ways of pronouncing the same letter. And you can do this with 15 of the consonants in Russian. So pronunciation time. The basic rule is that consonants are soft if they are followed by the soft sign and hard when they are followed by the hard sign. Have a look at what it looks like. The same goes for vowels. A, E, U, U, O. These here are hard vowels. Ya, Ye, Yo, Yu, I. And these are soft vowels. And how you pronounce hard and soft vowels is very, very important. For example, take the word for family. Simya. Do you see that soft sign there? Well, if there wasn't a soft sign, it would instead say this, which means seed. Seme. A completely different word. So yeah, pronunciation matters a lot in Russian. Now, if it's starting to sound like Russian is complicated, well, <laughs> to be fair, you are catching on. The funny thing is, compared to English, there aren't actually that many words. In fact, English has more root words than Russian. But because Russian words can be changed in so many different ways, you end up with a huge uh, vocabulary in the language. And to confuse matters more, because that's what we wanted after all, some basic words can be said in different ways. And there are subtle differences uh, in meaning. Like take, for example, the word again. Опять, вновь, снова, еще раз. You have to choose the right one. Because if you choose the wrong one, you can sound like you're being negative when you actually mean to be positive. There is a joke in Russia. When something annoying is happening again and, and someone asks, what, again? They often get an answer. Well, not again, but again. Опять? Не опять, а снова. Yeah, well, see, this is why you really need immersion when you're learning Russian, because these little things are always best learned in context. Context is the golden rule. And I am working hard on material to help you with that, so stay tuned. But something I really love about the Russian outlook is, is even though English has more than a million words, we still haven't really found a way to express certain feelings as precisely as Russian does. This is pretty mind-blowing, so check this out. Nadrif. Nadrif. Now, this is one of those untranslatable Russian words. The literal meaning is a, a tear or, or a rip, but no, see, that, that's not it. Okay. Think about a time you had extremely powerful hidden feelings about something and your emotional tension was maxed out. And then it suddenly burst out of you uncontrollably, like, I don't know, it's all kind of borderline hysteria. Now, add another layer to the meaning. Your outburst doesn't just affect the listener, but it also causes you pain. That's pretty intense, right? See, Russians have words for feelings that we, in English, would need a paragraph for. Let's have a look at another one. Taska. Taska in my best Russian pronunciation, which is not good. <laughs> I challenge you to find an English word that means exactly this. Now, tuska is a feeling of great despair that you can't quite describe. It's like a spiritual suffering or a pain in the soul for no particular reason. Vague anxiety, nostalgia, amorous longing. Yearning kind of comes close, but it's still really miles off. With such deep emotions allowed, it's hardly surprising that Russia is known all over the world for its incredible thinkers and artists. It's the writer Leo Tolstoy, composers like Tchaikovsky, and the writers especially have contributed new words to the language. If you're an English writer, imagine you were allowed to add a new word to the dictionary just to adequately express a feeling your main character has. That would be pretty awesome, right? So look, it is clear that Russian is an incredibly deep language steeped in culture and history. And so for me, the best way to learn a rich language like Russian is with a method that uses stories so that you can get drunk on the culture while learning the language. And in this video, I show you exactly how to do this. It's a simple, kind of strange, but very effective way to learn a new language using stories. And in fact, it's called the story learning method. So click the video over here and take a look. If you want to learn Russian, then learning with stories is hands down going to be the most fun way of doing it.